Uh, welcome everyone uh, and good evening in Canada and good morning in Australia tomorrow time. Um, this is uh, our second lecture in, the, in our World Indigenous Lecture Series. Um, and I'll uh, invite uh, Dr. Ted Christou, our Associate Dean of Graduate Studies at the Faculty of Education for a welcome. Thank you so much, Nadia, and thank you for your support in organizing today's event. Before we, we begin, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement in line with Canada's commitment to reconciliation. Queen's University is situated on traditional Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee territory. To acknowledge this traditional territory is to recognize its longer history that predates the establishment of the earliest European uh, colonies. It is uh, also to acknowledge the territory significance for the indigenous people who lived and continue to live upon it, people whose practices and spiritualities were tied to the land and continue to develop in relation to the territory and its other inhabitants today. The Kingston indigenous community continues to reflect the areas in the Shinabek and Haudenosaunee roots. There's also a significant Métis community and there are first peoples from other na nations across Turtle Island present here today. I'm grateful to live as an uninvited guest upon these lands. And wherever you are, please, at this time, take a moment to recognize the history and significance of the lands beneath your feet. I invite you to think about how knowledge of the land and its traditional inhabitants and any relevant treaties will enrich the space and support reconciliation. And now on to uh, today's event. It's such a pleasure for me to be able to introduce Dr. Vanessa Russ as part of our World Indigenous Lecture Series. Dr. Russ was the first Aboriginal Director of the Burnt Museum of Anthropology in its 40-year history at the University of Western Australia. Born and raised in the Kimberley region in Northwest Western Australia, with family connections to Ngarinian and Gija people, she has been in, in investigating the role of art history, colonization, and Aboriginal art for over a decade. Please join Dr. Vanessa Russ as she previews her up, upcoming book, A History of Aboriginal Art in the Art Gallery of New South Wales to be published by Routledge Press in 2021. Vanessa will examine the gradual invention of Aboriginal art within the Art Gallery of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, as art history shifts through social histories of Australia and the recognition of Aboriginal people through wars and political shifts through international influence and pressure to diversify collections. Dr. Russ examines state-of-the-art institutions in Australia and the single history of Aboriginal art uh, from early colonization until today. And I'm very pleased to get out of your way and, and allow you to please, uh, <laughs> Dr. Russ, please, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. What a lovely introduction. Uh, lovely to meet you all. I'm, I'm just gonna sh share, my, um, share my slides. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, I'm but I am talking to my current uh, book, which is a history of Aboriginal art in the art gallery in New South Wales, which is the result of my research that I did for my PhD many moons ago. Um, and it's interesting when I was preparing for this lecture, I realized um, that there's so much new knowledge that's come out since I did the work. So it's really exciting to kind of present this to you today and hopefully uh, in the future people will be correcting it <laughs> and making it better. Uh, at the time when I did this work, access to archives, particularly um, state institutions in Sydney was very restricted. Um, understanding around how research operates and then how uh, state government records should be used uh, was not necessarily even in discussion, whereas today the idea of digitization and, and data has actually meant that we have to kind of deal with this issue of who has the right to access information and from what point, is it today or is it 30 years ago? And so there is a lot of work to do. Um, I hope that I don't speak to you too much. I do feel like this is very dense, um, dense work. So I'm just gonna start by, uh, just recognising that I'm on, on Wajak Budja here in Perth and um, that my university uh, is on Nam in Melbourne. We acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we are joining this lecture on today. And we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging 
and the place of Indigenous knowledge in the academ academy and beyond. Uh, we further acknowledge and respect the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have always used resources from the land, waters, and waters for nourishment, medicine, and healing. And I pay my respects to your elders as well and thank them for sharing this opportunity today. Um, I kind of wanted to just frame a, a little bit about this lecture. Um, I, I think Ted gave a, a really great intro, introduction. I'm, I'm looking at things like colonial history as an overview, early exhibitions and definitions of art, first exhibitions of art in Sydney, the Garden Palace, how a fire reframed the Australian Museum, and um, the initial acquisition of Aboriginal art, curatorial influence, and then buildings and dynamics. So I'm just trying to cover a lot of those things. And it is quite, um, quite an interesting story to tell. I just wanted to start with um, a quote by curator Lisa uh, Grazio Corian, who asks, what is the value in bringing works of art that represent such different worldviews together in dialogue? It underscores that while the desire to construct meaning may be universal, what the universe means across cultures is not. In this moment of history, we can have the experience of cultural difference when we juxtapose two works of art as distinct as these and present them in the spirit of true equality. Um, and I think one of the things uh, that's really important in this research is that we were not working from a base of equality uh, in terms of how we define things. The early conversations around Aboriginal art in Australia were that, well, Aboriginal people don't have a name for it, therefore it's not art, therefore it doesn't exist. And what we know now is that in Europe, there was no name for art either. Uh, from I think the 13th century by off the top of my head um, and that that too was an invention as humans do so I, I just kind of think that that's where I started from I was really interested in how Aboriginal art exists in, state in Australia but it is, doesn't exist in any kind of really clear way and whilst the public now has become a real driving force to putting Aboriginal art forward um, it is still uh, as an addition to, and uh, we need to kind of reframe the mainstream so that the mainstream isn't still that, that main um, European model. And we need to think that through, but we're not there. We're not there yet, obviously. So when I was doing my research, this wonderful work by an incredible collaborative team, post-commodity post -commodity, who are from the US, um, they are from South, uh, the South, Southern uh, Native American artists, um, was carved into the exhibition space, which uh, was known as Urubana Gallery. Uh, Urubana Gallery was an exhibition space that was the first Indigenous named space, uh, Urubana meaning this way in uh, the Gadigal language. And they cut out a very sig significant square of uh, concrete to project sound, and it was the language of the Gadigal people into the earth. And I think for me, it was a really great experience because the sound just reverberated throughout the space, but it also makes you think of where these institutions are placed, the land from which they come from. So one of my most favorite artworks um, in terms of really exploring this idea. Um, and so we're just going to go a little bit into colonisation and, and explore it a little bit. Um, obviously, this is a colonised space, as you can see. So colonisation is deeply rooted in the history of art, art institutions in Australia. In colonising Australia, the British Empire was motivated not only to move populations that were impacting on the sanctity of London, but by trade. Science was in addition to and a requirement of purposeful, purposeful wealth creation through the identification and development of goods and services. And like the 13 states of, that make up the United States, Australia was originally made up of a group of colonies, New South Wales, Western Australia and South Australia. This is obviously the New South Wales colony. This image um, is quite a beautiful, very small uh, painting that is in the State Library of New South Wales. Uh, and it actually shows you uh, looking across uh, into Sydney Cove, um, 
over to the heads as they're known where the uh, boat races run every year um, and this is sort of just to so the smaller buildings on the right are close to where the Art Gallery of New South Wales resides at the moment. Um, this is a picture of the Garden Palace, uh, which I, I will go into. Uh, I think it's quite, it's my favourite story really when it comes to um, colonisation. When the first fleet set out to explore the southern land from England, they were on their return after viewing the passing of Venus between the sun and, and earth in Tahiti. Captain James Cook arrived on board the Endeavour at Botany Bay in April 77. He was met by two armed Gwigal warriors that remained nameless, yet immortalised through their con this contact. Uh, they basically uh, held spears up and, and were shouting for them to, to leave the land. Uh, but yes, it, was a very, it wasn't a very pleasant confrontation. The importance of considering place in this uh, is its potential to extend the worldview of art history. When Captain Arthur Phillips first landed in, in Warren or Sydney Cove, he believed it to be the perfect location to drop anchor. But as Grace Carsten writes, underlying the early wonder within the writings of officers in the first fleet and all the charming light-filled surface, the, hu the humorous and poignant stories was the inevitable takeover of land. This is not to romanticise this period of time. Life would have been hard. Uh, there would have been times of drought, of illness. Uh, you know, this is well before penicillin. So I don't like to romanticise pre-colonisation. Pre I think um, from my mob up home, there were times where lots of people would die just from not having any food, access to food. I know Desert Mob would talk a lot about not having access to water as well. So I think we just have to really keep our minds open. It can look really romantic when we look at the city skyscrapers that we all have to reside around. Um, by the 7th of January, 1788, the soldiers and convicts had cut down what they could and erected a battalion of tents that took uh, the appearance of a mil military camp. I love this image here. Um, this is also in the, in the State Library of New South Wales, and it's, it is actually an image of a, a woman um, who was fishing with her baby in, in the boat. Um, and fishing was actually a trade that a lot of Gadigal people did uh, when the coloni colonists first arrived. Um, and in some ways, they probably saved their lives because they knew where to get things from. Um, so it's a really poignant image to me. I, um, I don't know if you can see this, I hope you can. This is a map that I developed just thinking through the layers of land. It's, it's obviously a mud map. <laughs> I'm not so great at these things, um, but you could sort of see. So what I've done is I've tried to show you where the beaches used to be. So those beaches don't exist now. They're, they're basically walled off and it's very tidal. And I think if we do get climate change, climate impact from um, our overheating earth, uh, we will see those watermarks change the actual environment around the botanical gardens and the domain in Sydney. Um, you probably can't see, but number one is actually the Garden Palace, which I mentioned before, and I will go into it a lot more because it is the sort of an initial narrative around art and the issues of art in Sydney. But you can sort of see you know, over time, the Cahill Expressways sort of gouged through the centre of the botanic and domain space, and then the art galleries plonked on top, and then um, it now grows across. It's actually extending across the, the expressway. So, how land changes over time. Um, you can see the Opera House, which was used to be known as Benelong's Point because an old Aboriginal man called Ben Long used to live there. Um, and so I, again, it's just about reminding us all that, that Aboriginal people lived in these spaces, Every, even around where the Arkala of New South Wales were, we know that there were possibly camps there because people were fishing in uh, Woolloomooloo in the bay there. Um, and we know that there were shell middens there, but scientists never got the chance to actually uh, research them because they were removed for the Navy um, 
fleet before research could be done. So it's a really interesting way of thinking about how country over time transforms. And, you know, the, the botanical gardens were, it was a farm. It transformed over time to be botanical gardens because a lot of work was already done. But prior to that, well, it would have been beautiful, big um, palms. Uh, they would have been really tall, um, possibly 30 metres in height. Um, we know that emus and uh, geese, uh, we think that kangaroos might, may have been around in this space, but we definitely know emus were. Um, and a lot of indigenous <coughs> foods would have been present. And so when, the, uh, when Arthur first landed, he basically removed, you know, they cut down the palms. They used it for either housing or for firewood. It was a really good firewood. Um, and then that obviously transformed the space as well. And over time, they created what really is essentially an estate, which is how the domain got its name, um, that was around the governor's house. And over time, um, Governor Macquarie even put a brick fence, and that was to divide the good people from the bad, so the vagabonds from the elite. And the vagabonds at the time were Aboriginal people and Irish people. So just going into the history of art a little bit, um, again, we sort of start to see the invention and it's the Mechanics Institutes. And I have a funny feeling they may have been influential in Canada too, but I haven't done the work around that yet. But the Mechanics Institutes came out of uh, Scotland in the 1830s, or might have been a, a slightly earlier, but I think it was early 1830s. And they were set around the idea of educating the labour workforce. So those people who didn't have the opportunity to go and get a good education could go to school at night, so the first night schools, and they could get some form of education. Over time, uh, that education included artisan practices, so learning about the arts. <clears throat> Sorry, excuse me. Learning about the arts and um, also lectures and what they called uh, conversa conversations, I guess. Um, and I, I like to think of them as sort of smoking nights where they'd pull out their cigars and have a good old yarn about, uh, about the works that they were seeing. So very influential. Um, I should say that when we had a number of governors between um, when Captain Arthur Phillips was uh, initially made the first governor of New South Wales, um, we get to uh, Macquarie uh, and about 30 years later and Macquarie's kind of a little bit more interested in culture and the arts by that time. Um, but who should be the, the, the artist? Um, and so we have to also think through that most of the vessels leaving England would have had some sort of surveyor who had capacity to draw. Um, and so we do have all these early drawings. Um, I don't know if there are more out there, but I, I imagine that in some state, in state libraries and archives, there would be significant sets of drawings um, that demonstrate kind of this early history. Uh, and so it, uh, kind of in some way the first um, artist to kind of use that term. Um, and I'm sort of always thinking about how we define artists today. So that's, you know, someone of in potential excellence in practice who has an exhibition history and a sales history and and is recognised by their peers. Um, so it's kind of, I mean, you know, I don't think it's a very, it's a very fluid kind of definition. Um, so we didn't have any of that at the time. I mean, we know that there were um, some initial, you know, these gentlemen who actually had high skill and capacity to, to really produce, but they were really small drawings. Um, uh, so, it's just thinking about that early iteration of art and how it was framed and formed. It was really conservative in Sydney, like exceptionally. I mean, you know, England was conservative. Sydney was the next step. And that came from this real social pressure to get it right. Here's an opportunity to get it right. 
here's an opportunity to actually really define a, a nation state, but none of us have an education in this stuff because it really wasn't something you could go and get an education about unless you were from the wealthy classes and you could do a, you know, a, a, tr a grand tour of the continent going to, you know, France and um, Italy and so on. So I'm, I'm babbling, but, you know, there's so much interesting stuff around this. Um, so the School of Arts movement, also known as the Mechanic Institution, uh, Institute movement, spread through the English-speaking world in the mid-19th century. The Enlightenment period had uh, generated an interest in science, rationality and popular, mo uh, popular movement. Pub public lectures increasingly a common mode of social intercourse. Underpinning the movement was the idea that industry and society would benefit from education, educated artisan class and a new breed of inventor. Uh, the movement originated in Scotland, as I said, and it became really popular in New South Wales uh, with the first uh, institute opening in 1833. And I think there was one in, New South, in Newcastle and I think one in maybe Maitland as well. And from this, over time, we get this creation of the New South Wales Academy of Arts. And they sort of branch out from um, these early conversations around what is art. And the New South Wales Academy will, as I will uh, describe to you, uh, become the trustees of the board of the Academy of New South Wales. Um, Sorry, I'm working off two computers. <laughs> so the early exhibitions um, and definitions of art. Well, again, how do you define art? So Jacqueline Stretcher uh, writes that the study and promotion of high art through lectures and eventually the establishment of public art institutions were placed high on the cultural agendas of each of the colonies during the middle of the 19th century. This work by Conrad Martins was the first watercolor acquired by the New South Wales Academy of Art. It met for the first time in 1871, and it was a little group of men uh, with little professional knowledge of art who advocated for their own personal and cultural perspectives that were very Eurocentric and reflective of, I guess, the politics of the day. It was another three years before funds from the Australian Museum in Sydney was made available to purchase art. So this, you can see the date difference um, between this work and at the beginning. Now, look, they did um, have a series of, I guess, colonial exhibitions where all the colonies, so from Western Australia, um, South Australia and uh, Tasmania would contribute artworks. I, I think we should also use New Zealand in that because New Zealand was actually um, and some is still connected to Australia through this colonial structure, which we don't talk about that much today. Um, I'm moving away from the idea of decolonizing art institutions to we are a colony and how would we like to like make the colony better? Uh, because I think it polarizes us in the conversation and it doesn't actually make things better. It just puts us on two opposing sides. So we are a colony in Australia still. Uh, we haven't changed that fact. Our constitution still sits in the British parliament as we speak. Um, and we still do things with New Zealand that would have been uh, established through our colonial relationships. And those colonial relationships were about survival of the British colony at the time. So um, we'll go into a little bit of the, the, the academy itself. Um, so they were, it was really established in, uh, for the purpose of promoting fine arts through lectures, art classes and regular exhibitions. A sum of around 500 pounds was made available to acquire works. And in April, 1875, the trustees managed to obtain the use of a premise, a premises for an annual sum of 250 pounds, which is crazy money when you think about it. The hall was uh, intended as a temporary space until the permanent ga gallery could be built. Their first objective was to open a school of art to be supervised by artists and teachers, Giulia, Giulio Anavetti and Achille Somanetti. They also held exhibitions and conversation, conversations annually until 1879. Uh, this is one of the only etchings that, um, you know, is available that may reflect what it would have looked like in the hall. Um, 
it wasn't a huge space and it wasn't long, especially with the amount of money that they had before it really filled up. But it is, you know, the first iteration of an exhibition and art space uh, in Sydney. So it is significant in, in its own right. Um, and they sort of sat there, you know, for a long time. Now, there is another uh, etching, which I, I haven't been able to locate. Um, sometimes it's always stuck in my file somewhere um, that shows that actually it was set up by uh, wealthy men. Uh, women were able to attend with their husbands, but they weren't allowed to vote. They weren't allowed to make any decisions. So again, we then have that kind of split and it is, you know, it's a social structure that was formed and it is good for us to recognise that that uh, women were participants. Um, and we know that uh, I, about 50 years from this point, it was primarily women who were doing the art classes and attending them. And so we do know that there's that conversation that also is underlying this. It's not just about the lack of Indigenous participation or um, whether Aboriginal people had a right to be artists and creatives uh, or were recognised as anything but savages. So it's just it's kind of to think about it. This is Sydney. This is what Sydney was like at the time, which if you were to blink, it could have been somewhere um, off Soho in London. So I'm going to kind of go into this bit of a deep dive into the Garden Palace. Um, the Garden Palace to me is a really fascinating story uh, and again taken from um, the idea of uh, I guess the trade, the trade shows uh, that would have been held. Um, I might just drop down, I'll come back to this image. Um, so you know the, the great exhibition in Hyde Park in 1851 which was later known as the Crystal Palace um, you know, it, it was, I think the exhibition was, it was called the Great Exhibition of the Worlds of Industry of All Nations. Um, and it included things from all nations, you know, dioramas with Aboriginal people with spears and, you know, dressed up as you would expect them to look perhaps or not even truly as you would expect, but how the, uh, the person creating the diorama would have thought it to be. Um, this is one of the first world trade fairs, I guess, and there was a huge competition between England and France to put on the best trade shows. So, of course, you know, uh, good old Sydney and Melbourne um, were competing for the same sort of thing. And so the Garden Palace, um, and this is often a really fascinating conversation that I find with people because they like to think that the, the trade fair that happened in Melbourne was before Sydney, but no, Sydney got in there first. Um, and again, driven by the New South Wales um, Agricultural Society. And so uh, again, driven from the idea of trade. So, you know, it included um, farm equipment and, you know, new farming techniques and, you know, that, that sort of stuff, but it also included um, colonial kind of exhibitions and, um, quite a lot of uh, huge amounts of information and material. I'll just take you through to, um, this is the ethnological collections. Um, and it, uh, hopefully you can see um, that on the, on the right hand side of the image, there are bark paintings on the walls. Uh, there's fishnets hanging from the ceilings, there's spears. Um, so it's a really interesting uh, exhibition of materials, but these were from conquered lands, right? So again, another really interesting idea around the colony and um, that sort of, I, I don't know, promotion of itself as a, as a viable and important um, player. The catalogue for the ethnological objects in the Sydney International and that said the exhibition was for the proper exhibition of savagery, savage finery and the relics of barbarous nations doomed to soon disappear before the advance of the whites as the Australian Aborigines had almost done. That was in the catalogue. The total number of objects in the exhibit was around 5,200 items. Of these, um, the Aboriginal objects were grouped at around 819 in a different sections 
belonging to 15 different exhibitions. Um, there were also objects from New Guinea and the Pacific Islands as well. And the main contributors to the ethnological section was private collectors from the Maclay and Cox collections, the governments of New Tasmania, South Australia, Western Australia and Queensland and the Australian Museum. The Australian Museum contributed 1,922 objects and they won a medal for their, their contribution. Uh, so again, this is actually a part of the trend that was going on at the time, these international exhibitions um, included often donations of cultural material from different countries, either acquired from their colonial governors and donated. Um, sometimes you'd have massive uh, loans. So for the Garden Palace loan, there was a, a I think it was um, the Queen's collection was lent for the for exhibition. So quite a significant, uh, hugely uh, entertaining, I guess, um, experience. I believe that over the time that it was open, uh, a million people, can you imagine? This is a little tiny colony where the indigenous population is vast and spread out, but probably not a million people. Um, and so, you know, it would have been quite extraordinary to experience if you were from, from home as they would have been, you know, the mother country was England um, or, or the, somewhere in the UK. And you had this kind of really interesting uh, opportunity to view, view material. So again, I'm sort of exploring this idea. You can see this is a really great image because you can see the exhibitions of artworks. I mean, crammed in. Um, the Garden Palace closes. Obviously, the exhibition finishes up and the Queen's Collection moves to Melbourne and um, you know, there's a number of things. So I'm going to sort of explore this space a little bit just to give you different viewpoints because we have this politics playing out. The Academy uh, at the beginning goes, well, we're not going to show here because, you know, it's a bit dark and dingy and we don't trust steel. Wood's the thing that you should be using if you're going to build a gallery, right? So this is new technology. Um, they brought lighting from London, which allowed them to work overnight. So they built this thing in like a matter of months, which might have taken, you know, a couple of years to build in, in the old ways of doing things. So not a lot of trust in it. Um, so the academy didn't move in the end. They were offered spaces, but they didn't move. Uh, the other part to this is that the, the sort of, uh, I can't remember what they were called, but they were like the curators of the show. So there were people that were uh, local and there were also international um, uh, representatives who actually made decisions about what to, what to uh, contribute to the exhibition and how it would be shown. And when they came out to see the space, they, they themselves were also really concerned about the light. And so the colony of New South Wales built a second building again in great haste uh, but it had a lot of um, more you can see photos of this as well but I haven't <laughs> I didn't want to put too much stuff on this slideshow um, but you can you know it is a, a bit better it you know, has sort of ceilings that have um, you know light coming through them so it's a little bit more appropriate but again, it's also made of timber, not steel, you know, so it's kind of obviously going back into that comfort zone around building materials. Um, so the Queen's, Queen's collection goes into this space and so does the Austrian collection. And, um, you know, so it's a very European based uh, exhibition space. Um, and it, it does do quite well itself. You know, it's people are, quite proud of the fact that, you know, this is the first time they really get to see art. And here we have that also that idea that art's finally separated from the ethnographic material. It's finally separated from science. It's, it's separated from sort of the industry and technology. It is its own thing and it's now being elevated up, up the chain of kind of excellence and value in, in society. So we must be a good society because we have this extraordinary facility. Um, so again, it's really uh, to me it's it's a really interesting um, interesting story. Um, so I guess okay. So then, what happens with the academy 
is they, they're running out of space. So they basically opened their doors, you know, or I think it was like a Tuesday, Wednesday thing where the public could come in for free during the time that the exhibition was open. And then once the exhibition closed, they complained about not having enough space to the then governor. Um, and he was like, well, what about the fine arts addicts? You know, like you didn't want it before, but it's now. So they basically uh, relocated their entire collections um, into the fine arts annex. Um, and that opened in July 18, oh gosh, I've got to find a date, sorry. Um, oh, sorry, 1883, it opened as the Art Gallery of New South Wales and then quickly renamed the National Gallery of New South Wales and then renamed the Art Gallery of New South Wales a couple of years later. So uh, again, there's this idea of, you know, we've got the National Gallery of Victoria, which is the NGV, um, and it would have been the National Gallery of New South Wales, but they decided that they should make it more local focus. Um, so again, there's this wonderful little play between... Uh, Sydney and Melbourne going on at the same time. And then the fire happens. Uh, I love this part of the story. Um, well, I don't really, it's very sad. Uh, so a massive fire comes and totally guts the building. Um, it was so hot that there was not even a chance that they could do anything about it. Um, the fire destroyed everything. Uh, the 1881 census, um, some land occupation records, um, the Linen Society's library and the Department of Fisheries collection of fish illustrations, and obviously the ethno ethnological collections. So the, possibly the first evidence of Aboriginal art, if we were to define it from that point of exhibition um, and display. And so it, devastating. So there's a lot of uh, speculation that it had some of the earliest Gadigal, Eora nation um, materials in it that, you know, don't really exist anymore. Um, not for any reason other than the pressure for that mob to not speak language, to not practice culture um, was really high, higher than anywhere else. Uh, they were removed, they were placed on reserves. So, this would have been really devastating for the people who'd been participating in it. The other interesting part was that local art societies had also been given space inside the building and they'd started exhibiting, you know, so this is the artist run initiatives, right? The earliest forms of that, they started exhibiting shows that they lost all their works as well. Um, it was really, really from a culture standpoint, a devastating fire. But again, it goes back to that story of the building, as I was saying, this idea that um, people were frightened of steel and, you know, but the whole thing just crumpled, it melted away. Um, and again, I'm just gonna go back into buildings. I know this doesn't feel like an art, a history of Aboriginal art, but I'm gonna get there. It's just, there's so much gap to talk about really. Um, so they moved into the fine arts annex and then suddenly, well, not suddenly, but it eventually built a really nice, healthy sort of damp situation. Um, it's very much built, um, the whole botanical gardens is built on, you know, underground streams and springs. Um, they're a lot more contained now, but they would have been across that entire space before car, the Car Hill Expressway was put in. A lot of that water gets diverted now into the tank stream, which runs right underneath the city buildings and comes out in Circular Quay where the ferries are. If you actually go there, you can actually see the water coming out still. And um, the other stream comes through the botanical gardens and you'll see there's a, a quite a significant pond and then that goes into, um, goes also into the cove as well. Um, so, they kind of argue, okay, we've got termites and damp and look at what happened to the fire of the garden palace and we're in a very precarious position. Um, but no one could agree. So we've, we've got a few things going on. We've got this conversation that's been going on for years around building like a South Kensington styled museum, gallery, collections, education kind of um domain area and they were definitely talking about that when uh when the garden palace was both erected but also once the fire had happened they were like how where are we going to put the australian museum now and you know so there was this really interesting conversation and 
and I, I, I kind of am going to skim over it a little bit, but the actual South Kensington precinct was uh, established by Prince Albert, uh, I believe, and he set out to do a sort of education and training and um, and that's again about if you educate the masses that they get civilized, right? So, so there's a really interesting um, part of part of that as well. And but South Kensington, if you've been there, it has you know museums and galleries and gallery spaces and performance spaces and so on. So it's sort of a very interesting space. So I, I, what they ended up building was the little brick building that you can see in this photograph at the back um, of what would be the next iteration, which I'll get into. Um, it was known as the art barn. I think some people called it the wool shed because it was literally a shed. Um, the window you can see on that building was put in after it was built. I don't think it had any windows on it. It was just literally somewhere to put the art whilst they had the debate about where to put the Art Gallery of New South Wales. So kind of forced the Art Gallery of New South Wales to be built, I guess. Um, and not, not the best of spaces, but at least it had somewhere to, to kind of go. Um, and this is around 1884. And the actual New South Wales government architect, uh, Horbury Hunt was really criticized for this building, but I think he might've had a few restraints on what he could and couldn't do. So he was looking for a quick solution that would be a part of a long-term solution because these things take time to build. Um, so I'll just go into the next one. And then, then we kind of get the second iteration, which is the facade that gets built by um, uh, Varan, who kind of gets to feel, fulfill his uh, objectives, but doesn't get to finish the actual institution. So they, they build this space. This is called the, South, the Southern Wings. Um, there's exhibit, exhibition galleries that look very much like the British model of gallery space. Um, and obviously the, the facade looks exactly like what you would expect to find uh, in, in the UK. Um, and again, it just reflects the colony. This is, this is the domain. This is a, a bit of a precarious space. You know, they had done work to try and move out the vagrants to move Aboriginal people off to La Perouse, um, but people were still there. So it wasn't exactly the safest place to be. Um, they spent uh, a lot of time in the dark. There was no lighting in there. Uh, so, you know, they could only do work when in daylight um, and there was a lot of pressure then to put lighting both in the gallery and also down the gallery road so that it became a bit safer. And then this is sort of that early exhibition space that I'm trying to get to. <laughs> uh, this is that combination of the two buildings. So if you go down the stairs, you head back into the art barn or the wool shed, it was, as it was known. Um, and this is the new attached uh, part of the building. Um, the painting on the left is the largest work that they acquired at the time and they couldn't fit it anyway. So in some ways that also was, I mean, if you want to build a building and you want to make it bigger, do things like buy really big paintings that you can't fit in, that you have to give to the Australian Museum to house or exhibit um, because you can't fit it in and then go back to government and say, look, we've got this painting, it just doesn't fit anywhere. Uh, and then you get a kind of a purpose-built space for it. But it's really interesting, this sort of dis dislocation that was going on in terms of exhibition practice. So we had the European materials and collections in the new facility, in the new space, um, looking very much like a, a British model of an exhibition space. You go downstairs and, and in the darker space where there is no, net, no lighting, um, aside from a very small window, uh, there is real lighting in it. And that's the Australian and colonial exhibition space. Um, so again, there's that, that next layer of, of art history, which disconnects the, the local from Europe. And I don't think it was done intentionally. I just think it's really interesting for us to kind of be the, 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 the people that were looking, looking at it now. In terms of intervention, how did Aboriginal art ever get into the Art Gallery of New South Wales? Um, well, I guess the thing for me is that it really started with possibly with the introduction of modern art. So as I was saying, the trustees were really conservative, right? They, 
They were wealthy to-dos. Uh, some of them acquired their own works. Uh, they all thought they knew art better than everybody else. They felt a huge responsibility for making decisions. Um, often the artists themselves, the, the artists living in and around Sydney would be um, really anti whatever decisions they made because they felt that they were being overlooked. Um, and when artists did come on the trustee board, they often did nothing. And it's hard to say whether they did nothing or whether they just weren't heard because they were local artists. They weren't European artists. So again, it's a really interesting conversation um, to think about in terms of how we frame art history today. So I guess the war as well. So World War II from 1939 to 1945 was a pivotal period for the Art Gallery of New South Wales. Um, and when this first exhibition of modern art um, called the Continental Art Exhibition came, it was actually in Melbourne to start with. It was driven by an entre entrepreneur and newsman, um, uh, one, uh, I can't remember his first name, Murdoch, who actually um, funded it to travel. It travelled to Melbourne and then it came to the David Jones Art Gallery in Sydney. Um, the David Jones Art Gallery in terms of the history of art in Australia is extraordinary and it's a whole other book. Um, but halfway through the war started, this collection of materials was in the, in the David Jones Art Gallery and there was a lot of public pressure to then show it in the Art Gallery of New South Wales. They selected around 20 works to start with and then I think they got more pressure and then they selected 40 works. Um, and so this is kind of the first kind of showing of uh, modern, modern painting. You know, I think the first time that Salvador Dali was shown in Sydney. And I guess attempts by the trustees to get rid of the show are, are, are extraordinary when you go through the minutes. Uh, they really want to actually send it back to Europe, but they get so much pressure. And at the time there was a Geneva Convention that said that during periods of war, the institution that had the works had to care for the works until it was safe to send them, to return them. So they, they couldn't do anything about that. Um, I'm probably gonna run out of time. Uh, so anyway, I just wanna go quickly. So we're in now in the basement space. This is underneath that Southern wing that you saw. Uh, it is originally used just to house all the crap that they didn't have anywhere to put it. Um, they then decide, and through this is through um, a trustee, John Solman, who's got a real interest in applied arts, um, that they should turn this into something where all the arts get seen. So, so they, and it's a really good decision. It, it actually influences again, like I was saying, the war is an influence point. And the war in Australia was really important because the Second World War, we were about to be invaded by the Japanese. And there was no way the British were coming to save us. We basically had to defend, defend for our, ourselves and we were eventually saved by the Americans. Uh, so it was a turning point in terms of being uh, a colony reliant on its motherland to a colony that just had to figure it out and rely on itself. Um, we got into lots of strife because at the time our, our Prime Minister withdrew all the troops from Israel and from, I think, the Middle East so that, that the fight could be had. It was so close. Japanese fighter planes were flying over Perth. They were bombing Broome. Um, they were sending shit as uh, submarines into sea. So it was a very precarious time. And in the north of Australia, Aboriginal people were assisting in the fight. Now, originally the propaganda was that all these Aboriginal people are gonna start fighting for the Japanese, you know. Uh, without the knowledge that actually Aboriginal people just want to fight for their own country. They know they're being invaded too. So it's a, it's a totally uh, interesting propaganda story. Um, but this space is really important. Uh, this space is important because, you know, we get the first acquisitions of art because we get a new director called Hell Missingham. Uh, by now, the trustees are reframing and restructuring their policies around acquisitions. They're still totally in charge, but they've gone through one or two directors who've had problems with the way that they do things. Uh, and then Hell comes in. Hell is a military uh, officer who was working on the radios in Sydney. He has a, he's an artist himself. He's from Perth. 
he has a capacity to uh, drive things. But he really struggled, you know, he spent years fighting with the trustees to not only he had no rights to acquire, uh, often the trustees would come in and start instructing on where paintings should go and moving things around. So it's quite a complex, um, quite a complex story uh, around that. These two works are just examples of some of the early acquisitions. So we're thinking, you know, 1947 is quite an early period for Aboriginal art. But the watercolour by Edwin Pararocha um, is one of the first works. All the institutions acquired a watercolour by, um, by someone from the Herm Hermansburg artist movement. Um, and so that was sort of the initial. Watercolours are always easier. They're much, they're easier to acquire because they're cheaper, but also they're easier to store and so on and so forth. But also it fits into the history. So as I said, you know, we saw the Conrad Martin work at the beginning. Um, and so the bark on, that you see here uh, is also a, an early acquisitions work. It's some of the early work that was done by uh, a, a curator called Tony Tutson. Tony's very influential in the story of Aboriginal art, uh, but also uh, from my research shows that Hal Missingham as director, he, he forced the pressure on them letting him acquire he forced the pressure on the trustees to allow him to participate in events and to, he went to every single art society. He was engaged across the network. He was a very influential person. And I, I understand that not a, not a lot of staff liked him. I think he might have been quite a military style person. Um, but without his pressure, I don't think the art colour in New South Wales would be as it is today. I think he really did transform the way the gallery was operating. Um, he, the trustees did their job and, and were trustees and not curators and, uh, you know, did, doing all that sort of curatorial stuff. He got people like Tony Tuckson in as a curator and then they started to think about how to acquire works of art they did, Tony and Hal did actually um, do a lot of acquisition stuff. Tony then was pushed up, um, you know, over time, Hal gave him a lot more responsibilities. Um, they worked with private donors to actually acquire works. Um, one of the works that Tony had worked with, um, uh, a man called Stuart Skogel, who was a doctor who'd spent a lot of time up in the Tiwi Islands. These are Pukamani poles. They're originally used for mortuary ceremony, but these ones were particularly made with the idea that they'd come into the gallery. They were acquired um, and transported on boat from the islands around to Sydney. So very precarious travel. They would have been super heavy. This is the first display. So an attempt to like build a display for them. Um, this was in, in Court 8, which were, you can see the colonial collections behind. So again, going into this in impact and intervention around art history. Um, and then we go back into the basement. So heading towards the 70s, get this new exhibition space. And it's a part of, the, it's called the Captain Cook Wing and it opens in 1972 but there is no space still for Aboriginal art. So Tony is kind of, and the staff at this point, Hal Missingham just, he just gets exhausted. They've built this thing. It's an extension of the gallery. It's, it's super modern space. And as they're opening it, Hal's, you know, on the Nullarbor plane driving back to WA because he's done. Um, and so Tony tucks and took, takes on the leadership role whilst they wait for a new director. And, and they sort of out of the exhibition spaces with the idea that there is nowhere for the Aboriginal collections. So the basement again becomes a really interesting space, doesn't it? So they then, yeah, as you can see, the Pukamani poles are moved into this space. It's very dark. I believe the walls are felt, a brown felt. Um, and again, it's it's starting to look very ethnographic and not very, you know, we think of the white cube gallery today. So we're kind of having these conversations going on. Now, Tony, at the end of his time, um, moved away from acquiring Aboriginal art because most of this material was uh, purchased through donation, funding from the, the gallery's uh, curatorial budget was not allocated to Aboriginal art at the time. Um, and in, in 72, I think it is, Tony starts getting really sore back. And by 73, when this show opened, he died of cancer. 
So a uh, very influential man. And then following on from Tony, we have Renee Free, who comes in. She's the European curator, and she falls, she pushes and pushes for the Aboriginal collection to stay a part of the gallery. She splits out the Aboriginal collection from the um, Melanesian and, and other materials that the gallery has been acquiring. And she pushes to have John Mundine as the first Aboriginal curator, although he's more of a consultant, he works external and inter internal. And there's a lot of things that happen and not at a fast pace, but we know that people have been working in a gallery for a long time to try and bring in Aboriginal participation. Um, and here we have another external narrative around, um, you know, there's this group of people, they, they Aboriginal people, they create uh, um, an art uh, society themselves, um, Kubumali. They basically set it up in the 80s. And from that, we get a number of curators. Um, those curators then start working in institutions like the National Gallery. Um, people like Ken Watson, for example. We also get um, Margot Neal. Um, and, and then we get Hetty Perkins. I can see that I'm running out of time. <laughs> so Hetty is... Uh, to me, one of the key players in this narrative, she's there in the background um, as a young curator. She works with a number of other non-Indigenous curators to pull shows together. And I think she did that throughout her whole career. Um, she would drive a force for a lot of exhibitions. Um, one of the most influential to me was Art and Soul. And that included a, a four day festival in 2010. Um, and then we kind of um, move into the debates around where we ex exhibit artworks from. And that includes uh, the Pukamani Poles again being relocated into what was then called the 20th Century Australian Exhibition Space. And you can see the bar behind, but we also have some non-Indigenous artworks to the left. Um, and that the one on the left, I believe, is a work by Tony Tuxton because he was an artist as well. So a really uh, beautiful um, story altogether. Uh, so um, I guess that that's kind of just the, the iteration. We do have acquisitions. Over time, one of the gallery guides becomes a really great donor and they set up a contemporary Aboriginal art um, fund that has allowed the gallery to acquire works um, over time. And uh, there was lots of work today, obviously the Urbana Gallery. And today it's the, the Sydney Modern, which is the new the new facility that's going to be open very soon, I believe. And that's going to have, so the, the, the works of art, of Aboriginal art are now going to be relocated into this new modern space and they're going to be sitting at the forefront um, of the institution's kind of model of um, art history. Uh, I have lots of reservations around this. Um, I've heard stories of them removing the historical component uh, I think when you remove history, you basically deny Aboriginal people's rights to have a voice. So that makes me very nervous. I think we need the colonial story. It's a really important story. Um, and it really uh, has to be a part of that. How do we build a colony into the future? And I also think there's lots of conversation at, in the Archive of New South Wales about acquiring only New South Wales artists versus acquiring a national collection. They have an extraordinary national collection. Uh, and I think they have done some really uh, great work in building the New South Wales collection. There are some amazing um, artists from around La Perouse. Um, they make the beautiful shell works. So there's, there's lots to say. I could have done a second lecture. Um, I think I might, I might end there if that's okay. Thank you, Vanessa. That was that was wonderful, and uh, and and sorry I had to change the vices, but I look forward to that second lecture. <laughs> I think we all do. That was so enriching, Nadia. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I it was very interesting and uh, fascinating to listen to. Um, I'm not sure if we have much time left for uh, questions. Um, Maybe if there is one question somebody wants to ask in the chat. Um, otherwise, um, our attendees are welcome to email the questions and we could uh, forward them to um, 
Vanessa, if that's okay. That is totally fine. Sorry, I feel like, see what I, I was telling you, it's very dense work and there's lots to it. And it, it, there's the colony story, the colonial story is not an easy one to tell because it is so complex. So, mm. and, and, and you told it so sensitively and beautifully, Vanessa, and, and thank you. And, and we'll be making this lecture available. So there will be, uh, there will be lots of opportunities in the future for, for others to, to benefit as we have just now and to reach out to you. Uh, in the future. Thank you so much. And hopefully I can come visit you sometime when we're all a bit safer. We would love that. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you again. Uh, on Becca joined us a few minutes late, but uh, Becca was helping us um, organize the lecture. Oh, and just we have some attendees saying thank you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you so chat. much, everyone. Okay, take care, have a good night.